Hello everyone, I am Left, and welcome to what's going to be a guide video for how to draft all of the captains, roamers, and supports in the game of Vainglory. Um, we're going to be going over in depth the strengths, weaknesses, and ways to pick each captain hero in Vainglory. Obviously, this is only going to be the, about the captain heroes, so if you came here to learn about the carry heroes and the junglers, you came to the wrong place. We're only going to be talking about the captains today, the ones that support their team, bring crowd control to the fight, and honestly are just the backbone and cornerstone of their team in general. So, like I said before, we're going to be going over each one in depth, in order, we're going to have a little slide for each one, we're going to talk all about the strengths and weaknesses, so hope you guys all enjoy and learn a lot, and I'll see you on the other side. So first, let's talk about Arden. Um, Arden is really great for creating zones of protection and adding on hit effects. So Arden has very, very high mobility as far as captains go. Um, every single one of his skills is a dash. Vanguard dashes to an ally. Blood for blood dashes to an enemy. Gauntlet flies to a certain spot. So if you play him right, Arden can be very, very hard to hit and very mobile like a pinball moving through a fight. His Blood for Blood is really great for adding on-hit effects like Atlas Pauldron and Shiver Steel. Well, Atlas Pauldron is an on-hit effect, but you get what I mean. So, also his perk, Julia's Light, or no, not Julia's Light, that's Celeste's perk. Julia's Gift is Arden's perk, and it, it renders him basically impervious to Scarf's and Adagio's burning. Also makes him very hard to take down and with Sky's forward barrage when he's on low health. Arden pairs really well with heroes that have some degree of self-healing. You don't want to play Arden into a double or strong heal comp when you don't have any heroes that don't have that have self-sustaining abilities. So what I mean by that is if you have Arden and then you have like um, I don't know Ringo and Glaive, you don't want to be going into um, Blackfeather, Adagio, Lyra. <laughs> Sorry, I sneezed. But basically, what I mean is. Arden, he can't provide healing to his teammates without a fountain. So what you want to be playing with when you're playing Arden is you want to have heroes that have at least some degree of self-sustain, like maybe a Samuel or a Scarf with Eve. Arden is also a little bit weak to heroes that have that can easily dodge crowd control, like say Blackfeather. While it is very easy to apply Atlas Pauldron to Blackfeather. Your ultimate and your biggest cooldown, the Gauntlet, can be easily cancelled by a single charge of Blackfeather's Rose Offensive. So long story short, pick Arden when you've got some relatively self-sustaining carry heroes and you're not facing double heal. So next let's talk about Adagio. Adagio has really high early game damage without even buying a single attack item. However, as a roamer, he falls off pretty hard in the late game. He's really slow, that is before you buy tier 2 boots. And he's also great when paired with a powerful weapon carrier that doesn't need to dive the backline. <laughs> Think Ringo, Saw, Kestrel, and Gwen with weapon power. They're all great targets for Adagio's B, Agent of Wrath. Adagio's immobility re renders him basically useless against mages like Scarf and Celeste in the late game. Your range has been nerfed significantly over the past year, and this allows Celeste to deal tons of damage to you. So same thing with Scarf. So Celeste and Scarf can do tons of damage to Adagio without him even being able to be in basic attack range of them. At least, that's in the late game when Celeste overdrives Heliogenesis. So, yeah, like I just said, Scarf and Celeste, other mages, will far outrange Adagio in the late game, so you need to hit your mid-game spike with Adagio to carry yourself into the late game. Also, I should add, he's probably one of the most difficult captains to play. Just because most captains get you in the mindset of protecting your team directly, where Adagio does not do that at all. He doesn't initiate, he doesn't, um, he doesn't initiate, he doesn't directly defend, he just kind of sits in the back line and does his own thing and protects his team from there with his abilities. So, yeah, that's Adagio. Let's move on to talking about Catherine. The Queen of Disruption is in a bit of a tough spot right now. No Wave Gauntlet is basically her whole ultimate in an item. So she's feeling a little bit replaced on that front. However, she's still a good pick into compositions that rely heavily on burst damage due to her bubble. But that means that you need to stay the hell away from tick and burn damage though, namely Sky because it will shred through her bubble. 
Now, if you don't know what tick and burn damage are, burn damage is anything damage over time that is inflicted by a burning source. Think Scarf's perk is burn damage. Adagio's fire is burn damage. Now, tick damage is also burn damage, but it's a little bit different. Tick damage is rapidly inflicted, and each individual bit of damage will be less than 77, because anything more than 77 damage will trigger Catherine's bubble. Skies Forward Barrage does not trigger Catherine's bubble because each individual hit is less than 77 damage, unless you have like 6 Shatter Glasses. So, Catherine is best played with a melee jungler that gains value from her stuns, such as Cruel, Taka, or maybe even Bap Batiste. I, I, I gotta pronounce his name right. I know that you pronounce his name Batiste and the P is completely silent, but I still mess it up just because I see the P. But. Keep in mind, Catherine is rarely, if ever, seen in Tier 10 and Pro Play at the moment. So let's now talk about Fortress. So Fortress is in a really great spot right now, and he can either be played as a roamer or a jungler, but we're just going to be talking about his position as a roamer today. As a roamer, Fortress is what you would call an enabler rather than a protector. He does not directly protect his teammates in any way, but rather he enables them to attack the enemies in a better way. His speed boost and extra life steal granted to allies through truth of, the, truth of the Tooth makes him a very strong pick in tandem with a composition who wants to get ahead early. Try pairing him with literally anything in the jungle as long as it's not Cruel, Blackfeather, or some other kind of late game hero. If your hero is at all decent in the early game, just being paired with Fortress in the jungle will give you an early game advantage bigger than what, what you would have, say, if you were paired with Catherine or Arden. But, for all of his current merit, Fortress does pretty poorly into Lyra. Although he can apply mortal wounds, Fortress is completely shut down by Lyra's Bright Bulwark. Bright Bulwark cancels his A ability, it cancels his speed boost, it cancels the dive from his teammates. You know, usually Fortress is played with using two dive heroes, like maybe a lane glaive and a jungle taka, and well, Lyra can shut all that down with one good Bright Bulwark. So you have to be very careful playing into Lyra as Fortress, however, if you are smart enough and good enough to bait out her Bright Bulwark, then you can go in and wreak havoc on the team, because Fortress's ease of applying mortal wounds can really shut down Lyra's healing. So Flicker is also in a good spot this meta. He excels at getting an early game advantage using his stealth, since basically no one buys scout traps until 4 minutes anymore. Use him to grab a really quick first blood on the vulnerable enemy laner, and go from there with an aggressive jungler to snowball your enemy. Flicker has some big weaknesses, however. Obviously, good vision completely destroys Flicker's value. So you'll need to stay ahead in the early game and keep them from placing lots of vision on your side. If they do, you need to be very deliberate about clearing it before you go on any coordinated dives with your Mooncloak. Speaking of coordinated dives, they hurt Flicker very badly. Flicker is the kind of hero that needs to be the one initiating and not the one being initiated on. So if you are initiated on as Flicker, there's not a lot you can do to protect your team. Your, your abilities are very offensive with Flicker. You really don't have any com straight up defensive capabilities. So if the enemy executes a decent dive on you as Flicker and you don't hit your fountain, well you're pretty much dead and that is Flicker's big weakness. You have to be the one initiating with Flicker. So, say, it wouldn't be really a great idea to pick Flicker against a, maybe, a fortress. Or, it wouldn't be really a great idea to pick Flicker against an enemy team that is Taka and Blackfeather. It would be a good idea to pick Flicker with a team that is Taka and Blackfeather, just not so much against. So, bottom line, Flicker does not have very many direct defensive capabilities, that comes at the cost of his stealth. So, when you're playing Flicker, make sure you're the one initiating on the enemies, and they're not initiating on you. So Lance has endured some slight nerfs to his cooldowns as of late, but he's still as good as ever. Lance has so much direct protection for his carries, but he can struggle if there are multiple diving threats on the enemy team and he is the only peel. Missing Githian Wall is a basic, basically a death sentence for your carry if you're playing against dive heroes like Kashka and Taka, because after that your only play is trying to make a backwards impale on a likely mobile target. 
Lance is very good with Glaive and other heroes with reliable stuns. This combo of Lance and Glaive is repeatedly banned in the Vainglory 8, and it's no it's no reason or it's no there is no guess as to why it is banned. Lance is just absolutely amazing with in, in tandem with heroes that have reliable stuns such as Glaive or Celeste or because Impale Although it is not a stun, it sets up everyone else to, to get their crowd control down, and it sets up everyone else to hit their skill shots because of the way it roots the enemy. So you want to play Lance if you have, um, if you're facing against dive heroes, and you likely want your carries to actually have some own self escape, some some of their own escaping abilities. But Lance is just he's just pretty good overall. Um, a couple of heroes that you don't really want to be playing Lance into, one of them would be Vox. Sonic Zoom makes it very hard to hit him with Impale. Um, another one might be Sky, although there is a big discrepancy whether you're fighting Sky in the lane or the jungle. She's very easy to deal with in the jungle because you can bash her against a wall. However, she can easily dodge around your Impale and Githian wall out in the openness of the lane. So let's now talk about Lyra. So the Queen of Healing has sustained a few nerfs recently, most notably targeting her insane early game harassment in the lane. While it's no longer really safe to harass an early or mid game powerhouse like Gwen or Ringo, Lyra can still reliably hurt late game spikers like Scarf, Baron, and Celeste. Her utility is unparalleled in the captain category. Her ability to shut down diving assassins with a single spell from her book is godlike, but it has a significant cooldown. Don't Bright Bulwark before the dive, do it after the first person jumps in. Stopping Taka from using Kai Ten after he has already jumped in with X-Retsu is much more valuable than just stopping the X-Retsu. However, Lyra plays pretty poorly into teams that just sit back and don't need to dive. Think a Saw Push Comp. A Saw Push Comp can seriously mess Lyra up, as can mages like Celeste and Scarf provided they make it through the early game. If you're faced with this kind of team, Lyra is actually not too bad of a choice for a dive captain, paired with Kashka, Taka, Glaive, or Alpha. Arcane Passage is great for getting your team where they need to be without using boots or dashes or anything like that, and it's also really great for applying an instant Atlas Pauldron onto basically all of the enemy team. So now that we've talked about a little bit of how Lyra works um, with Bright Bulwark and Arcane Passage, let's talk about some Imperial Sigil stuff. Imperial Sigil is something that we talked about in the Flickr slash Lyra video that I made a couple weeks ago, um, and I just want to re reiterate a couple of the points I made there. You, there are different, there are different, um, let's see, there are different thresholds of value for Imperial Sigil. Um, you want to be healing a target that is getting value if there's a fight going on. Get it by getting value, I mean. If you have a low health Ringo in the back line, not in danger from any enemy fire, and then you have a half health Rona who is using red mist on two enemies, you're going to want to heal the Rona because she is getting a lot of value. You're going to be damaging the enemies, healing Rona, while she is also damaging the enemies. So you're going to get much more value healing Rona than you are healing Ringo. You can heal Ringo next when, you're, when your cooldowns are back up and the Rona has already killed the enemies. So. When you're using Imperial Sigil, you gotta do those quick calculations in your head to see which of these targets is the most valuable for me to hit with Imperial Sigil. So let's move on to the last captain here, which is going to be one of my favorites, Finn. Ah, Finn. Finn is absolutely amazing at creating anti-melee zones for his carries. What I mean by this is that melee carries should be very scared to die of a fan past level 8 due to the big stun from Quibble and his ability to grant fortified health to his allies while pulling enemies toward him. So what I mean by this is if you're playing say like Alpha, there's a huge zone around a fin that you don't want to be going into because of Quibble and Polite Company. He also makes it pretty hard for um, diving heroes to actually take out his carries because of the fortified health granted from Polite Company. And also, he's great for picking off fling enemies with a hook, although it's not completely recommended. You can also initiate with the hook, too. It's a little bit predictable to initiate with the hook. I personally don't initiate with the hook very much because it always gets blocked. I like to save the hook until halfway through the fight when the low enemy is trying to run away, but that's just me. However, Finn has a huge weakness, and that is his movement speed. 
Finn has by far the worst rotation speed in the entire game in the early game, and a smart enemy will exploit that so hard. They will go hard after whichever carry you leave alone in the early game, knowing full well that you are way too slow to get to them. Be very, very, very deliberate about your positioning in the early game as Finn, because the wrong move will cost you a lot of time, and if your enemy is smart, gold and kills as well. So, to talk a little bit more about Finn, you don't want to be picking Finn with fast heroes like, say, Kashka or Taka. You want to be picking Finn with maybe a carry that can stay behind you, um, some, someone that benefits from a little bit of protection, like maybe Celeste or Scarf. Um, a high priority target that is always going to be dived by the enemy, such as Baron, would be a good choice to pair with Finn. Maybe even go for a Protect the Baron comp with a Glaive in the jungle. So, now that we've talked a little bit about what laners go well with Finn, if you want to play junglers with Finn, think things like Cruel and Rhyme and maybe even Samuel. Um, Samuel would go well with Finn just because of the zoning that Samuel creates with Drifting Dark and his Empowered Malice and Verdict Shots where Finn is also creating a big zone around him where, where melee heroes can't go. Um, if you were to do maybe a double mage comp with Finn, and you had those two mages with some decent self-sustain, maybe like Samuel with Eve and Celestial, actually no, that's double, that's double crystal. Double crystal is okay though, don't get me wrong. Um, it's just not always the greatest idea. Um, like, you give those two mages a little bit of self-sustain, and then you've got a Finn on your team with a fountain, um, that's a pretty formidable team comp right there, because you're all like, well, I, I want to dive those mages, but I can't, because Finn was just gonna, sh Finn's just gonna hit the quibble on me, they'll chain stun me, and I'll get exploded. So that's where a lot of Finn's value comes from, is creating this big protection zone for his carries that melee heroes are scared to dive into. However, like I said before, enemies will abuse his early rotation speed and use it to gain an early lead on you. So if you don't let them do that, you will be an unstoppable force and an immovable and an immovable object as Finn and you will win the game. So that's going to be it for this video today, you guys. I hope you all enjoyed it and learned something useful. Um, I'm sorry that there wasn't more gameplay in this video. Um, I just felt like I had to, um, I don't know. Make a, make a few slides just to, just for some illustration purposes. I think it would have been a little bit more distracting if I had a gameplay while I was talking about each captain. So that's going to be it, guys. I'll see you all later in the next video. Um, yeah, I'll see ya. Goodbye.